Welcome to Behind the Music, the Houston Chamber Choir's weekly podcast. I'm Sinjin Flynn. This time on Behind the Music, we're joined by British composer and conductor James Whitbourne, who worked with the Houston Chamber Choir in September of 2019 in Houston, where he came to participate in the choir's performances of his work, Annalise. James, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It's lovely to talk to you. Let's talk briefly about Annalise. This is a choral work that uh, you premiered, you wrote and premiered, I think, in 2005 in London. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's a full length concert work, uh, really, and designed as such a, a short concert, just um, about 75 minutes. But it's it's designed to be the, the complete um, concert. And it's a setting of um, parts of the diary of Anne Frank. It's the first ever time the, um, those who, who govern the text had, had allowed um, the diary to be set to music in, in this way, or, or actually used in any substantial way for a, for a large work. And for that reason, it was it was really a very special project to work on and, and a very privileged position to be in. And yes, I came over to um, Houston. It seems extraordinary to think actually an, only a year ago. Um, right. we, we find it difficult to think about performances uh, just at the moment in, in this period of, of lockdown. But um, um, yes, um, there it was, real live people making music together. Um, and it was it was a wonderful invitation to be to be part of that um, period of preparation and rehearsal for the concert um, with the Houston Chamber Choir. Had you been to Houston before? I had been to Houston before, actually, but not for not for quite a while before that. I I came actually to to visit NASA um, some some years ago um, to to interview um, one of the people that had walked on the moon uh charlie oh, really? duke and yeah and and so i had been on that occasion but i hadn't really engaged with the uh, properly with the musical scene um and, and until in, in person uh, until last year had you heard of the houston chamber choir before you got the invitation i had heard of the houston chamber choir um partly because of its reputation but also partly because um a friend of mine uh, was had been working for the choir, uh, Grace Roman. Um, uh, she and her husband uh, uh, are friends who I know from Westminster Choir College. Um, oh, right. And also via Westminster Choir College from, from their travels to Oxford. Um, I, I have a base in Oxford and, and we have a residential um, period each year when one of the choirs, the Williamson Voices from... Westminster Choir College comes over to Oxford to be a, a resident choir um, for a, a course that we jointly run um, uh, for choral conductors and, and they're the resident mm -hmm. choir for it. And Jim and Grace had both been part of that in, in the past and, I, and, I, and I've kept in touch. So, so yes, I was aware of the, the choir and its doings. I think one of the special things about the performances were that uh, the chamber choir collaborated with the Holocaust Museum in Houston, um, which was opening a brand new building. Were you able to, uh, to take in the Holocaust Museum while you were here? I was, I, I made a point of uh, going around the museum um, a couple of days before, just, just on my own, actually. I just wanted, um, you know, they were very kind and, offered to show me around and 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 um, they kind of introduced it to me and and then I, I said you know would you mind if I just just look around on my own because I think there's something um, that I think you approach a museum in a different way if you're taking things at your own pace and you're just pausing on the things that you find um, particularly moving or engaging or interesting um, so yes, I did spend quite a bit of time um, in, in the museum and actually it was the collaboration, it was the fact of the collaboration with the Holocaust Museum in Houston, which, which was part of the reason that, that 
coming over was was also attractive it, it it's not possible you know to to go to every performance of course right. um, of, of Annalise and this is one that I was uh, invited to and I think you know um, the, the the renown of the choir and and the opportunity to work with with Bob Simpson their conductor um, and the choir and but also this collaboration with the Holocaust Museum and this expansion of the museum and that particular new venture was was, was one of the reasons it, it seemed to be quite an important thing to do. So you weren't actually conducting the performances but you did introduce not. them? I was not, yes. Um, Bob Simpson, um, Robert Simpson conducted the performances and indeed the rehearsals. Um, but um, we had a, a nice um, collaborative um, dialogue both in the build up and um, whilst I was there um, and also in rehearsals themselves to some extent um, you know he would turn to me and, and ask me for some explanation or for some opinion um, by that stage of course the piece is, is in different hands um, right, and this right. is one of the you know this is one of the interesting things about being a composer that um, you write a piece with a very clear idea of, of a sound in your mind and and uh, at each performance, you, you get a different sound from uh, not only from the one that you heard last time, but also from the one that was in your head. And you have to make a quick judgment. Is, is, is that wrong? Is it different? Is it better? Is it, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, all, all of these things sort of fly through your head in, in a short space of time. And then sometimes something um, wonderful comes out of a performance and you think, yes, that's 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 a slant that is new to me, but, but is wonderful. The version uh, that was performed here in Houston is the, uh, the chamber version has a uh, smaller orchestral forces. Um, I think it was violin, cello, clarinet and piano. Is that correct? That's right. Yes. Yeah. And um, solo soprano. And solo soprano, yes. So the piece was originally written. Um, it, it was in, in, in its premiere and pre-premiere, it was written for choir, soprano, solo and orchestra. Right. Um, and that was the original um, com term, you know, terms of the commission. And that was how it was originally performed. Um, <clears throat> but um, I knew that... Um, Actually, it would receive more performances if there was also another option for um, choirs um, right. to to stage their own performance and hire a smaller number of musicians. And um, actually, John Rutter came to the first um, performance. It's very kind of him to to come, and he wrote me a lovely letter um, afterwards. And he, in that letter, um, said, you know. Just, just something that I've mentioned. Uh, I've, I've found um, uh, it's, it's often a good idea to have a, a, a small version as well. Um, and In the back pocket. <laughs> well, yes, and or yes. Uh, maybe the front pocket, even, even. You know, um, <laughs> I, and I found that, um, and 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 he and Tim Brown, who'd um, prepared the choir for the first performance, both said the same thing. So I, I kind of set set to work. Um, and actually, I originally scored it for piano trio. Um, mm. And when I uh, I went over to Westminster Choir Co College, James Jordan had shown an interest in this and said, yes, he'd love to premiere it in, in that version. So um, I, I wrote this chamber version for those three instruments, plus choir and soprano. Um, and then after the premiere, um, uh, which James Jordan and I conducted half of that us each um, uh, with Westminster Choir College, um, Williamson Voices. Um, and then after that um, premiere, I then added a fourth instrument. Uh, it, there was something about the ability, I think, to be able to write a, a triad without using the piano um, mm. that just made it that much stronger. And the clarinet, um, proved a wonderful addition, and and that was the version that I that then became the chamber score. So 
It's almost um, like I, uh, I like it. I like it very much in a different way from the orchestral version. But uh, you know, it's it's not just the paperback version in my mind. It's just a, it's it's a different version. Version, yeah. It's almost like the quartet for the end of time. You 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 use the instruments that uh, as they did in the camps. They use the instruments that were to hand. Yes, so the clarinet yeah. gives it that uh, that link. Yeah. And that parallel has, has been pointed out to me. I, 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 I wish I could have, I wish I could pretend it was a deliberate choice, but it was a nice coincidence that, yeah. that, it, that it was the um, same orchestration as, as, as Messiaen had used. A different sort of um, camp, of course, uh, prisoner camp, but, but yeah, a, a sort of poignant symmetry. Yeah. The choir, I understand, were in... I was going to say costume, but that makes it sound frivolous. But they were they were garbed for the 1930s, weren't they? They were on the 1940s, perhaps. Yeah, um, they 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 absolutely were. I think that that proved um, a particularly effective element, especially in that context. Um, the performance space at the Holocaust Museum in, in Houston is is not huge. It's an intimate space, um, and it's not got the sort of resonant acoustic that you might choose for choral singing on a on a normal basis. Um, right. So it it was, I suppose, a little bit more like a theatrical um, performance. It was a very mm -hmm. intimate um, uh, uh, setting in which the um, singers could really be facially expressive and, and could speak in a very direct way to the audience. And of, of course, um, with a choir of that calibre, um, they certainly don't need an acoustic to cover up their work. Right. Um, uh, um, uh, some, sometimes, you know, a, a very dry acoustic can be quite difficult for choirs. Um, but this, this choir did not have a problem with that. And, and, um, they were able, I think, to use that setting to their advantage as a, as a as a way of communicating very directly, and I think the the sort of semi staged um, um, appearance w was was part of that communication process for right. them. Annalise was actually Anne Frank's first name. It was yes, the, her full name. She's. She is generally known as Anna or Anne, um, which is the shortened version. Right. Um, but we think towards the end of her life, she 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 um, liked to um, use the full full name as well. Mm -hmm. But I mean that is that is her full given name, and it seemed um, an appropriate way of in, entitling the piece, right. which is really. Um, I like to think of it as a portrait, um, a musical portrait in, in, in 14 uh, short scenes, each of which shows some side, some different side to her. Um, and I think once I started to frame it in my mind as a piece of portraiture, um, the name started to look after itself. You know, originally I'd thought is, is it a requiem or a cantata or, you know, th these other names had come into my mind. Um, but in the end, Annalise was, was the name that was all that was required. What do you term it? Do you think of it as a cantata or an oratorio or is it, does it not really fall under any of those rubrics? I don't think it does quite. I I, I do think that that it is a, a, a portrait, right. um, and and you know a portrait painted in this very fragile medium of the human breath, um, mm. and a portrait which just lasts for seventy five, eighty minutes, whatever the length of that performance is. It's it's there. Um, and for that time frame, um, the kind of memorial of this young woman exists again. Um, 
And for me, this is a, it, it's a rather beautiful way of, of um, creating portraiture in a, in a, in a, in a, in a specified time frame. And it's rather different, I think, from um, a portrait that hangs on the wall as a piece of artwork. Um, this is one that requires, you know, a, a large number of other human beings in order to create it. Mm -hmm. um, the the soprano solo um, soloist and the choir. Um, the soprano soloist, by the way, also was in in costume and and um, uh, sang from memory in a, in a very fine performance. Um, and all of these elements um, come together and and they they just form in the air, in in sound in in sound waves. Um, this piece of portraiture. Um, and if I may, if I may say so, um, part of the privilege of, of writing the work in the first place was was to get to know um, uh, those family members of Anne of Anna Frank who, who remained, um, particularly Buddy Elias, her first cousin, who was really instrumental in in getting this piece to, to you know to be permitted. Um, and I met one or two of her other friends as well, Hannah Gosler, who appears in the um, in the piece. And it was very important to me that they could recognize the person that they knew in in this port in this portrait, um, which they told me that they they really did and that it was an important thing for them. And that that was the sort of affirmation that I really sought and, and needed. Written in English, your libretto. Um, mostly in English. There's a little bit of Dutch, um, and there are a couple of bits of German as well. Because um, she wrote it in, it was, in Dutch, didn't she? Originally. She wrote it in Dutch. Yeah. Um, and there is half a plan um, to do a Dutch version at at some stage. Um, I think that would be a very special thing to do. Um, but no, the decision was taken quite early on to, to write in English. Um, and in spite of that, it, it, it has been performed many times in, in the Netherlands. Um, as you know, uh, Dutch people are, tend to be extremely fluent at languages and, and um, English amongst the many languages they tend to speak and understand. Um, so that is that has never been a problem. In in putting together the uh, the text, how did you approach that? Because um, it it's not necessarily uh, the excerpts are not necessarily chronological, are they? No, they're not exactly chronological. There's there's a sort of broad chronology that they follow. But there are also um, variants to go with um, uh, thematic consistency um, or t uh, telling the, the broader story rather than the strictly chronological um, one. The, the whole um, idea came from um, a young poet called Melanie Challenger who approached me um, with the idea of, of doing something with the Anne Frank story. There's a whole story of how it developed to this particular piece, but it was it was her concept um, in the first place. And she um, was very instrumental in the structuring of um, of the libretto and and, you know, finally takes credit for for the formation of the of the libretto itself. But it was a very, very collaborative um, process. I think I spoke, to, we spoke to one another on the on the phone just about every day for about a year. Um, as we came, you know, shall we do that? No, let's go in a slightly different direction. Shall we do this? And and it eventually came down to to this sort of, it distilled down to the thing that we both felt it was meant to be. Um, and it looks, you know, very straightforward now. But it was actually quite a complex <laughs> process getting to that point. Right. 
Let's talk about about you in in broader terms than just uh, Annalise. Um, were you raised in a musical family, James? I was mu I, I was raised in a family that had music in it, um, although none of my family was a musician. Right. Um, my mother has always enjoyed listening to music. My father used to sing in a local um, choral society um, mm. and and had as a chorus, uh, as, a, as a boy sang in his local church, as I did. Um, so there was music around, but it wasn't the overriding feature of our, of our household. Um, but I, I, I would certainly had opportunities to be introduced to music um, and uh, I'm very grateful for those. You studied music at uh, Oxford. You went to, uh, I think you were Magdalen College, weren't you? I was, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I, um, I got a place to read, um, for, to study for a degree in music at, at Magdalen College, Oxford. Um, and I also sang in the um, chapel choir um, there at Magdalen. Um, which is one of the ancient choral foundations um, founded in the 15th century and has been pretty much continuous until until now, actually, um, until COVID came along um, right. and, and it's just creeping, creeping back. Um, and and we sang even song almost every day uh, in the in the college chapel. So it's quite a commitment. Um, but a, a very wonderful opportunity and, and an extraordinary experience. And, you know, I always advise composers um, who are interested in, in, in writing for choirs to sing in a choir themselves, because once you know what it feels like, um, this is, yeah, so uh, th th that was certainly a very formative um, part of my musical development and compositional life as well. I think one of the fascinating things about the English choral tradition is the role that Oxford and Cambridge have played in in defining that tradition. Yeah, I mean they do have a an extraordinary um, role in that, and it's it's love. I mean, I'm I'm still in Oxford. I, I've sort of returned to Oxford um, many years later in, in a different capacity, and we can talk about that later. But um, um, I think one of the things that is so wonderful about those two places in particular, though there are other places in, in the UK where it's also true, um, is that singing in that particular context is a very natural thing because it, it's supported by the weight of, of tradition. And so um, people... Uh, end up going to chapel and singing in chapel choirs who are not necessarily people that that would have been attracted to chapel life or to to singing in a chapel choir in, in a different context but because it's something that's always happened there and it's very much part of college life um, it's a very natural thing to, to do where you're not um, under under pressure in a way to be a particular sort of person um so it's it it has i think an openness and an, a, a sort of broad breadth of access um that's perhaps diff more difficult to find in other settings and i think that's part of the reason it continues to be so well supported um today when you finished your undergraduate degree how did you determine what you were going to do next? Well, I'd, I had, of course, as all undergraduates have, a very um, limited experience of the professional world. Um, but I had seen that in the course of my own um, activities, um, when the BBC had come along to, to broadcast um, Evensong, from from Magdalen. Um I had seen what went on there, or at least had seen part of what went on there, and I'd been attracted by the idea of of possibly joining the BBC, and I, I sought to do so. Um, and 
it wasn't a particularly um, easy process. It took took a took a while to to get it to happen. But I I was eventually offered um, a position um, in the BBC, <clears throat> which was um, it was not a particularly important post. It was just in the in the administrative office of offices of Radio Three. But the um, the the HR person at the time said, look this is a job that's probably going to take you about two or three hours a day to, to do in all honesty. Um, <laughs> so use, use the rest of your time to look around the BBC and, 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 you know, find your way around, go to studios. Um, and that's exactly what I did. I, I, I don't think that sort of invitation exists anymore, but that's, that's what was said to me at the time. So I did my job and, and I spent a lot of the, rest of the time going into studios um working with um or just just um eavesdropping and and um observing um recording sessions with some extraordinary artists um and absorbed a lot of how things worked in that in that process um and then uh within a within about a year or so i'd got a different i'd managed to get on a different track as a trainee producer and 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 then i um joined the religious broadcasting department. Now that was an extraordinary department to be in because um, it enabled one to fulfill lots of different roles. Um, so I was able to be a producer, a presenter, a conductor, a, a composer. Um, and as long it was, as it was all within the broad subject matter of religion and ethics, it, it was all fine. Right. Um, so, um, oh, and reporter as well. I, you know, I worked on some religious news programs as well. So I, I did all so, all manner of things, um, but including um, uh, conducting the choir for the daily service, which was a very important part of my formation. And we should say that uh, BBC Radio Three is the uh, essentially it's the national classical station, isn't it? It is, but BBC Radio 4 is also a very important platform. And, and in some ways, it was, it was the place that I found um, my musical voice. Um, Radio 4 is really a speech network, but there is um, music on it, including the Daily Service, which runs on, on Radio 4. Um, <clears throat> and the audience typically is a very intelligent audience um not necessarily specialist musicians so it's a it's a sort of broad audience but a thoughtful audience um and it was for that audience that i suppose i started my compositional output um rather than for radio three which is a more maybe a more knowledgeable musical audience and that's where Cora Levenson right. sat so I you know I worked for Radio 3 as well but it was the combination of the th two networks that I think was quite formative um, for me. Working in radio uh, I've spent many many years um, working in radio and and I've always found it to be the most intimate medium um, because when you're behind the microphone it's you and essentially it's one other person isn't it you're talking you're having a conversation with one other person um yes what it always makes you think of or makes me think of is um how are you presenting how are you talking to your audience and i wonder how that experience being in radio has affected your or impacted your composing? Um, well, it, it certainly did impact my composing and, and for, for reasons that I think belong to the time because I was working in that realm, particularly in the 1980s and 1990s. And, <clears throat> um, well, particularly the 1990s. And this was, I mean, it seems curious now because it's not very long ago but this was largely pre-email um oh, the good and, old days <laughs> <laughs> well certainly the different days um yes. and um the way it worked is that um 
I would often, you know, write a little arrangement for the for the singers for the daily service. I would then the next day I would, um, you know, get copies ready. I would take them along. Excellent singers. They could all sight read. Um, we worked on it um, for for an hour the mo that morning and then at 10 o'clock or quarter to 10 as it now is the daily service would be broadcast live a 15 minute service then after that you would walk back to the office and this is the thing that wouldn't happen now but but at that time the phone would would start ringing and you would hear the secretary in the office you would overhear the conversations with people um, with listeners who were phoning in to ask what that piece of music was and you know could they get a copy of it or could they was there a recording and that kind of thing and in that way i i i learned very quickly what was what was touching people what was communicating with people and because this was a very genuine response which was not people had no idea that i was able to overhear the conversation um <laughs> Uh, and it's quite different from the sort of feedback that you might get at the end of a concert, where generally speaking, people that come up to you find something polite to say. Um, right. But this was a very sort of honest bit of feedback. Um, and and I found it very, very interesting um, uh, to, to, to see, to understand really, to learn how I could communicate um, most directly with with this particular quite broad audience, so in that way, I think it was it was a very important part of my compositional makeup. What was it in your music? Do you think that that touched people? Um, I think I, I I hope that I write music that has depth. Mm -hmm. um, but I was also, also looking for ways to find breadth, and I think it's I think this is the hardest trick to pull off when you when you're writing in a language that is um, comprehensible to a to a wide you know to a broad audience as broadcasting needs to be. It's no use writing in a language which is very specific only to a few people. You're talking um, about a musical language. I'm talking about a musical language, yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, so th you're writing in that musical language, but with with a depth that makes, um, brings new ideas. You know, there is, there is always this um, suspicion, I think, particularly amongst some of the cognoscenti in this country, I think that music in a, a comprehensible language maybe has less to say than music in a difficult or a new language, more complex language. Mm -hmm. But I was faced with the discipline of working it within broadcasting and I knew the audience. So I was always trying to find something um, that ways to bring depth to my maybe techniques. There may have been even little techniques or references that just maybe I knew about myself only. Um, uh, and the, I, I knew the audience wouldn't know them, but, but I knew that they were there. And that was enough to, to for me to know that, 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 that there was integrity with the music itself, and that, but still I could write it within a language that could be understood. Um, and Annalise is also full of that, by the way. I mean, there, there are there are dozens of little musical references which I know people will not notice, but I know that that there, and and that's part of what I I kind of enjoy about it. Who are your musical idols? Do you know I'm I have I have such a wide range of. Um, uh, influences and sources um, and I found over the years that it's not um, that I don't necessarily look to the complete output of one particular person um, 
but that I that I there there are little moments in a in a particular work or a particular composer's output which I just find extraordinary, um, and which I've found myself going back to or, or actually maybe just memorizing. Um, and you know those can be as wide ranging as as um, Mozart or Stravinsky, Morricone, um, uh, not all within classical music either. Um, moments within um, Arabic music as as well. I've been working recently on um, an Egyptian project, um, so I tend to get little little sounds every everywhere that kind of stick within me, and I and. I kind of fuse them together in in whatever way comes out, but I think that would be a more honest answer than saying you know it's it's all about Rachmaninoff who is wonderful, but um, or right. or all about just one person. Um, it's it's bits from all over the place. I think. In terms of your own compositions, are they exclusively choral? They're not exclusively choral, although. Um, uh, choral music is is has been the the larger part of of it. There are some instrumental pieces, um, and uh, in fact, I just having having written many pieces that have organ in involved. Um, I just last year written my first solo organ uh, piece for an organist in Houston. Uh, funnily enough, um, uh, Jim Roman, who I mentioned earlier, um, mm -hmm. and but. Even with instrumental pieces, I, I've I found it helpful to have a, a story to work with. Um, and uh, there's a piece for organ and saxophone that I wrote called A Brief History of Peter Abelard. And that tells the story of Abelard and Eloise. Eloise. Um, and this organ work um, uh, tells the story of one of the um, NASA um, Apollo missions, um, mm. Apollo eight, um, and so it has a it has a sort of programmatic feel to it, which I found quite helpful. And I suppose for me that that is a substitute for having a text to work with, um, which is always such um, a, a wonderful um, starting point for for writing music because each text, of course, has its own music already embedded embedded within it and right. and it's a question of getting to that music and then embellishing it um so i suppose um the the greater part has been uh choral although funnily enough i think probably the music that that first attracted the most attention was an orchestral score um which i wrote for um a set of um a set of bbc and discovery channel um documentaries called um, uh, Son of God or Jesus the True Story, I think is is what it was called in Discovery. But there, it was a big um, sort of film um, score, orchestral score played by the BBC Philharmonic. Um, and that was perhaps what, what first attracted the, the attention. Are you still working for the BBC? I still, uh, I still do um, bits and pieces for the BBC. Yes, um, I, I've been, <clears throat> I've been the producer of Carols from Kings for a, quite a number of years now, um, and I still, I still do that um, on an annual basis. And I, I still work on on state um, broadcasts as well when they, when they crop up. So I, I, I maintain um, a very happy relationship with the BBC, but. But generally speaking, my working life has has moved um, else elsewhere now. You teach in the Faculty of Music at Oxford, Oxford University. Um, I'm I'm a member of the um, music faculty um, at Oxford. Yeah, and I um, actually from earlier this year, I was appointed director of music at St Edmund Hall, which is one of the um, colleges. Um, constituent colleges in the university. Um, so in that way, I I now have um, a role directing the music in in that particular college. Um, but actually, the teaching that I I do is is 
um, generally not um, for um, undergraduates in music, but for um, students who come as part of our continuing education um, program, mm -hmm. um, particularly over the summer months. Um, I run a course in choral singing. Um, people come from all over the world um, to be part of that and to experience, I think, a little bit of what, um, uh, you know, singing in a, an Oxford chapel choir is like. Um, we have a beautiful setting uh, at St. Stephen's House and um, <clears throat> it's, it's very much the sort of makeup of a standard Oxford choir and we work together for a week and make music together. Um, and then I, then I do a, a, quite a number of other um, courses over the summer months as well. The one that I mentioned in, with choral conducting and collaboration with Westminster Choir College and a lot of that kind of teaching um, happens um, outside of term as well. Do you find that there is a, uh, a tension, if you like, between your writing and your teaching or um, do they fit together really well? No, they're absolutely complementary. Um, I think um, composers learn all the time. Um, you know, you can write things at the extreme of people's voices if you want, and you'll always find a few choirs like the Houston Chamber Choir that can, can do those pieces. Um, <clears throat> but you'll often find that if you put it in the hands of uh, or the voices of another choir, um, it won't sound as beautiful as you hoped because you've, you've stretched the voice in, in ways that aren't particularly easy um, or right. comfortable or natural for, the, for, for most singers. And so you, you kind of learn that if, if you want something to sound beautiful, you, you're, you're best off writing it in a particular way that gives it the best chance of, of sounding beautiful. And there, therefore, to, to work with um, a range of choirs and a range of singers is immensely helpful. Um, <clears throat> you know, young composers who have only had the opportunity of working with um, the very finest choirs um, find it, um, you know, quite an eye opener later on when then they hear their piece in a, in a different setting and it suddenly doesn't sound quite the piece that they thought it was. Um, but no, if you can write a piece that, that can be sung beautifully by the very, the very finest choirs, but also very beautifully in different ways by, by community choirs and by choirs of other traditions, um, then, then you find a, a kind of a richer output for your, for your offerings, I think. During the, uh, the summer courses, what is it that you are teaching these singers? You said it's a continuing education, so they yeah. have a, a, I would imagine, a fairly strong background in, in choral singing. What is it that well, not you necessarily, are... Not necessarily, not necessarily. I mean, continuing, okay. the, continuing educate, the Department for continuing, continuing Education at Oxford um, is open to all people over the age of 18. So it, it has a lower age, age limit. Um, and um, people can apply to be on these courses who, who, who have not necessarily sung a lot in choirs, but they might, they might have wanted to, but have perhaps never had the opportunity to mm -hmm. sing in this kind of choir. But they will have had some kind of musical background. So, you know, maybe it's a, somebody who's studied the piano a lot or they've been a violinist and they would love to have sung in this sort of Oxbridge um, chapel choir, but the opportunity has never arisen. And this is a great chance for them to, to discover what it's like. And I would say that my my role is is um, more about creating an atmosphere and an, and an environment mm. than for, as it were, in your face teaching. It's about putting the music there, putting the tradition there. You, you know, you're in this place. You're in this wonderful dreaming spires city. Um, you're in this beautiful location. You're in this wonderful building with a with a lovely acoustic 
you've got all this tradition, you've got hundreds of years of history behind you, here's the music, um, let me bring it to you, help you, guide you through it and create an environment in which you can f discover it. And, and that's really what these courses are about rather than sitting in a classroom and saying, you know, let me, let me teach you about music theory. Um, so it's a really sort of practical um, um, course in which we, you know, you drop those things in. Of course you do, um, but you, you drop them in sort of casually rather, rather than making a great, great thing of it. And, and people have a wonderful sense of osmosis, I've discovered, and absorb things very quickly and, and get, really get into it. Finally, let me ask you about your current compositional projects what are you working on at the moment james that's uh, that's inside your head yeah it's it's been a very difficult period i think i i think i'm not the only composer that that will have told you that um during this period of silence um it's been it's been a difficult time actually to 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 be writing new works um Part of my compositional process is, is trying to imagine myself in, in the audience, if you like, at the, at the first performance of a piece um, and sort of thinking what I would like to hear at that time. And when you know that everything everywhere is in silence, it's rather disconcerting. Um, <clears throat> but I, I was very fortunate that I'd there, there were a few projects that I had already started before that lockdown period happened. There was a um, a conversation that had already started with the director of music at Peterhouse in Cambridge, one of our you know colleges companion choir. Yes, one of the colleges in Cambridge University um, with a similar sort of choir. Um, and they had, he had come to me with, with an idea and we'd started talking about possible texts. So that project has, has continued and I, I started working up ideas for that piece. And it's going to be a, a piece with a rather beautiful epiphany text by a former master of Peterhouse, um, Joseph Beaumont. Um, and uh, there's another piece, uh, the details of which I haven't, been announced yet but which I have also which I had also just started working on um, and and so I'd already got the kernels of those ideas um, already in, in process um, and then actually there was an orchestration of, of a piece which I wrote for um, Christchurch uh, Cathedral in Houston also conducted by Robert Simpson Simpson mm -hmm. um, and I wrote uh, this carol for, for Bob, um, Bob Simpson and his cathedral choir um, last Christmas. Um, and then another choir in Houston, um, St. Luke's, had heard it because they'd heard Bob singing through it um, and had asked me to, uh, to write an orchestration uh, of that piece. So that's another thing that I've been doing these, these um, last weeks. And I think they've got an ambitious plan to, to record it um, remotely. They're going ahead with an orchestra uh, even, even now. Um, so, so I've been very well occupied with, with these things um, uh, over the past months. Well, look, it's a great pleasure to be able to talk to you <clears throat> about your music and about your uh, associations here in Houston. You are in, I think you said Seven Oaks in Kent in the UK at the moment. So I hope that's absolutely that you, right. That's where I am at the moment. Yeah. I hope you and your family uh, stay safe. And I hope uh, that the music does not dry up. I'm, I'm hopeful that it won't. I, 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 can, I can feel other things coming on. So thank you very much. It's been, been lovely to talk to you today. Thank you very much, James. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you to all of those who support the Houston Chamber Choir, whether as a supporter, a patron, or as somebody who is an audience member. We appreciate all your support. My name is Sinjin Flynn. This is Behind the Music. Thank you for joining us.
the Houston Chamber Choirs with One Accord is your one-stop shop for choral joy. If you enjoyed this podcast, help us to continue our mission to grow the esteem and appreciation of choral music by sharing, reviewing, and subscribing to our content. As a 501c3 nonprofit, support from listeners like you allows us to continue to create new and exciting programming. For more information about us and how you can support our work, please visit HoustonChamberChoir.org give.